has now grown into a national restaurant workers organization about 12 years later. We have about 13,000 members in 32 cities, about 100 employer partners, employers who range from Tom Colicchio, star of Top Chef, who's actually a great partner of ours, great employer, all the way down to small mom and pop restaurants around the country who are doing the right thing, and several thousand consumer members. And we've won some things. Um, you know, we have actually organized workers, several thousand workers, in about 17 or 18 large high-profile restaurant companies, and we've won back about $9 million in stolen tips and wages. We've won raises and benefits and promotions and job security and grievance procedures <clears throat> for workers in all of these companies. Um, as I said, we've organized these high-road employers across the country to form an alternative national restaurant association that's speaking up for higher wages and better working conditions in the industry. We've actually opened our own worker-owned restaurants called Colors, one in New York, one in Detroit. That was filmed in our worker-owned restaurant in New York. That's not how we treat our workers. That is scripted. Um, <clears throat> but that's our restaurant. And inside our restaurants and in partnering restaurants around the country, We've trained thousands of workers to move up the ladder to livable wage jobs. Um, we've conducted lots of research. We've done over 6,000 surveys of restaurant workers. We've put out two dozen reports on the industry. We raised the wage uh, in New York State for tipped workers. We made it illegal in the city of Philadelphia to deduct credit card processing fees from workers' tips, which is legal in most other parts of the country, so leave your tips in cash. Uh, and we just won a bill in, in Washington, D.C. that extended paid sick days to tipped workers. So we've won some things at the local level, and we've won some things around the country. But for me, the most amazing part of the last decade has been getting to know the stories of thousands and thousands and thousands of restaurant workers across the country. And learning things I had no idea about as a card-carrying foodie eating every day in New York City. For example, I thought I was a good tipper. You know, I, when you move to New York, they tell you you should tip about 20%. That's what a good New Yorker, New Yorker tips. I had no idea that the tip I was leaving in New York, and frankly in 43 states in the United States, was not a tip at all. It was the wage itself because of a man named Herman Cain. Do you remember Herman Cain? I was previously Godfather Pizza, and at one point in 1996, he ended up the head of the National Restaurant Association, which we call the other NRA, and which, by the way, kills more people annually than the NRA that you know about. The other NRA and Herman Cain struck a deal with Congress back in 1996, saying that they would not oppose an increase to the overall minimum wage as long as the minimum wage for tipped workers stayed frozen forever at $2.13 an hour. And so the wage for workers who earn tips in the United States is still $2.13 an hour in most states in the United States. It's not that here in California, but almost everywhere else you travel, the tip that you leave is not a tip, it's the wage itself. I didn't know that. I thought I knew something about health and safety in restaurants. As I said, I grew up here in San Diego, in LA, I remember in LA growing up, they would always put the letter grades in restaurant windows for sanitation purposes. So I thought I knew like, oh, A means healthy, B means not so healthy. I thought I knew something about health and safety in restaurants. I had no idea that 90% of restaurant workers in America don't have paid sick days, which means two thirds report cooking our food, preparing our food, serving our food when they are ill with illnesses, true stories from my book with like H1N1, like hepatitis, like typhoid fever. We have a member who just testified in the Florida State Legislature about working for several weeks serving food with typhoid fever. True stories. I thought I knew something about competition in restaurants. A lot of us watch the shows, Top Chef, Iron Chef, Cupcake Wars, you know, we watch these shows. I had no idea that for most workers in this industry, getting to a decent livable wage job is a matter of your skin color or your gender. There are right now over 10 million restaurant workers in America. It is actually now the second largest and absolute fastest growing restaurant employer in the United States. That's the restaurant industry. One in 12 Americans right now works in the restaurant industry. And yet it happens to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the US. So every year, the US Department of Labor puts out the 10 lowest paying jobs in America. And every year we win the award because every year six or seven of the lowest paying, 10 lowest paying jobs are restaurant jobs. And every year the two absolute lowest paying jobs in America, lower than farm workers, lower than really anything 
else you think of as a low paying job, at the bottom of the heap every year are the people who touch, cook, and serve our food. How is it? How is it that you've got the largest and fastest growing industry in America proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs? The industry likes to say it's because they suffer from uniquely thin profit margins. They always say, you know, you don't understand what it's like to run. We have the lowest profit margins when, in fact, nationally, nationally, the national average profit margin for the restaurant industry is 4 to 5 percent, which may sound small until you know that Walmart, which is generally considered to be one of the most profitable companies in the world, has a 1 percent profit margin. So we've got huge national chains leading the other NRA, the National Restaurant Association, experiencing literally hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, high volume restaurants experiencing very high profit margins, and fighting at the same time to keep the wage at $2.13 an hour. And saying to the American public, that's okay, these are young people, these are guys who earn an average of 17 bucks an hour as a waiter or a bartender. When the truth of the matter is, if you look at government data, 70% of workers who earn tips, 70% of the workers who earn that $2.13 wage are women. And they don't work at the fancy fine dining steakhouse here in the heart of San Diego. They work at the Olive Garden or the Red Lobster. They work at Applebee's and IHOP or Denny's. They suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce. And they use food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce. And that's including tips. If any of you remember reading Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Nickel and Dime, you, you may remember that the section of that book where she acted as, she was an undercover waitress, was the section where she couldn't actually afford to pay her rent. She lived in her car. And in fact, there are millions of restaurant workers, women, mothers on this, in this country, who actually are putting food on our tables while they cannot afford to put food on their own family's tables and bordering on homelessness every day. There's a story in my book of a young woman named Claudia Munoz. <clears throat> Claudia was an immigrant from Mexico, very smart young woman, ended up working at an IHOP in Houston, Texas while she was going to graduate school in Texas. Um, so a young woman who actually considered a career in the restaurant industry, was very interested in hospitality. A young woman who earned the minimum wage for a server in Houston, Texas of $2.13 an hour. Now, when you earn 2 or 3 or $4 an hour as the tip minimum wage is in most states, you don't actually get a wage at all. Your wage is so low it goes entirely to taxes and you get a paycheck that says, this is not a paycheck and it says zero because your wages go to taxes. Right? Now the law says that the employer is supposed to make sure, in every state where there's a lower minimum wage for tipped workers, the law says that the employer is supposed to make sure that tips make up that difference between whatever the lower wage is and the regular minimum wage. But the IHOP, mega corporation that it is, and even though it is illegal, told Claudia, the manager at the IHOP told her, I don't want to be held liable for whether tips make up that difference or not. I'm going to report that you're earning $7.25 regardless of what you actually earn. And so many slow days and nights at the IHOP, it's a 24-hour restaurant, Claudia would sometimes earn zero or two or three dollars an hour in tips. Sometimes she would take home nothing at all. Sometimes she couldn't afford the gas to get to work. And she would say, she said to me, sorry, I'm ashamed to admit it, but there were many times when I would flirt with the cooks or the managers to get extra food to eat because I was so hungry. In fact, we all were, all of us women, we would flirt with the management, we would flirt with the cooks so that we could get extra food to eat because we were starving. And one night, Claudia worked a full night shift at the IHOP in Houston, Texas, and it was a busy night. And at the end of the night, a couple walked out without paying the bill. And illegal though it is, and even though IHOP's a mega corporation, the manager at the IHOP told Claudia she would have to pay for that walkout, even though it was $20 more than she had earned that entire night. And so Claudia ended up paying $20 for the luxury of having worked a full night shift at the IHOP at Houston, in Houston, Texas. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story from thousands of workers across the country. In fact, I was recently doing a book talk in one of the most conservative parts of the United States, Bentonville, Arkansas. You know where Bentonville is, it's the headquarters of Walmart. Uh, and I was speaking to a room of 300 people and there were two state legislators, two Arkansas state legislators in the audience. 
And I told Claudia a story, and I was so sure that they would get up right after me and say, she's crazy, she doesn't know what she's talking about, nobody earns $2.13 an hour, if we had to raise the wage, restaurants would go out of business, I can tell you all their arguments. The guy got up right after me and said, thank you very much. I have to say, to what she said, that happened to me every night I worked in the restaurant. The guy had worked in bars and restaurants all through college, all through graduate school, until becoming a politician. And every night they would ask him to pay for the walkouts, which is illegal, but they would do it. And every night he would know what it's like to work as a tipped worker. Here's the part of Claudia's story that actually hurts me the most as the mother of two little girls. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And I imagine that, you know, probably like most young women in America, their first job will be in a restaurant. And I'm proud of that. I'm glad that that's going to happen to them. What I'm afraid of is what happened to Claudia, which is that when you have an industry that forces women to work off of tips, that makes them incredibly vulnerable to whatever the customers might do to them, however they might talk to them, however they might touch or treat them inappropriately. And in fact, our industry suffers from four times the sexual harassment rate of any other industry in the United States. 7% of American women work in restaurants, 37% of all sexual harassment claims to the EEOC come from restaurants. If you have to basically interview for your job every time you go to the table to earn your wage, because your wage comes from tips, you need to subject yourself to whatever that customer might do to you, talk to you, treat you. We've had so many members around the country who tell us they get sent home because they're not sexy enough, because they're not showing enough cleavage, because they're not showing enough skin. We have members in New Orleans who told us they have to flash in order to be able to punch into the restaurant at all. Our industry suffers from very, very high rates of sexual harassment, and that's why we say Herman Cain left a legacy of harassment in multiple ways, right? Not just the sexual harassment that he probably did himself, but the fact that he left a legacy in which women can be paid $2.13 an hour, and that this is the world of work that we are actually opening all women to. On my 60 City Book Tour, almost every time I give this book talk, at the end of the talk, somebody comes up to me, some woman, and says, you told my story. I now work as an IBM executive or a corporate lawyer or a union organizer, and I've been sexually harassed on the job, but I never did anything about it because it was never as bad as it was when I was a young woman working in restaurants. That's what I'm afraid of for my daughters. That's the way it should not be for anybody, anybody in the United States. And yes, here in California, we have the same wage for tipped and non-tipped workers. That is actually in jeopardy. I will tell you in a few minutes why. But we don't have utopia here. We definitely don't yet have utopia. We have members right here in Los Angeles who, because of a lack of paid sick days, you know, San Francisco is the only city in the, in the state of California where there's mandated paid sick days for all restaurant workers. So here in Los Angeles, we've had members who've come with us to Congress and said, you know, a, a woman named Gloria, a member of ours, who came with us to Congress and said uh, she was working at the Burger King and her, she got a phone call from her family that her 12-year-old daughter had an unusually young and, you know, just very rare heart attack at the age of 12. She told her manager, I have to go, my daughter just had a heart attack. And the manager said, no, you stay or you lose your job. And so she had to choose, basically, between her job and her child. And of course she chose her child, but, you know, you ask yourself, how is it that you've got an industry? Where, how is it that you've got an industry where uh, people think of themselves as professionals, and that you've got anyway one of the highest rates of turnover of any industry in the United States? This morning, I was being interviewed by uh, by a restaurant rag, Restaurant Business News, and he said, you know, a lot of my our members, a lot of the industry doesn't like you because. Um, you talk about, you know, these tipped workers as if they're, you know, anything other than they are. What they are is young people who are moving on to something better. Which I always find hilarious that you've got an industry that basically says everything else out there is better than our industry, right? And you've got an industry where the workers want to consider themselves professionals, want to stay in the industry, love what they're doing, take pride in it, want to move up the ladder. But the industry doesn't actually want to see them as professionals or treat them as the professionals that they are. 
And in fact, on the contrary, they want to say to us that they should be the only industry in America that doesn't actually have to pay their own workers' wages. They want to say that you, the customers, should be the ones to pay their workers' wages for them. We don't pay other professionals in tips. We don't pay doctors or lawyers or politicians in tips, although maybe we should, right? Why is this the only industry that gets away with saying, we shouldn't have to pay our own workers' wages, somebody else should? It's purely because of politics, purely because of this industry lobby, the National Restaurant Association, that has been named the 10th most powerful lobbying group in Congress that behind closed door deals has actually won, not, at, not just at the federal level, but in so many states and cities around the country, constant exemptions for itself. Not just with regard to wages. So many times paid sick days that's passed in cities and states around the country, they managed to get tipped workers excluded. You know, we, every year we infiltrate the NRA's annual lobbying day. We infiltrated a few years ago when they were and the Speaker Boehner was addressing them, all the 400 or 500 corporate lobbyists from McDonald's and Olive Garden and Burger King and Red Lobster, and talking about how they should try to get restaurant workers exempted from health care reform, claiming them to be independent contractors because they don't get wages, they earn tips. Right? They try constantly and they proudly proclaim on their website that they've won a billion dollars in exemptions for restaurants over the last several years. Who's paying for those exemptions? We are as customers, as taxpayers, because these workers end up being forced to live on food stamps, being forced to live in extreme poverty. So thankfully, there is a real momentum for change. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't know what the president is saying, but we know he is talking about the minimum wage tonight. We're hopeful that he's actually gonna mention tipped workers for the first time. Uh, that they should get a raise after 22 years. Um, and there's momentum moving around the country. So there's a bill moving through Congress called the Fair Minimum Wage Act that you may know about. Senator Harkin and Congressman Miller, right here from California, introduced the bill. And after many years of fighting, we had a big victory that not only does it propose raising the overall wage to 1010, it actually proposes raising the minimum wage for tipped workers to 70% of the regular for $7. That would be a huge increase. It would be 300% increase for most tipped workers across America, but it's not enough. It is not enough. We need to get to the point one day in our industry where everybody gets a wage, does not have to live off the mercy of customers, does not have to experience a situation where their wages go up and down, but their rent and their bills don't go up and down, right? We need everybody to have a stable, base, livable wage. So we've got actually ballot initiatives moving across the country this year that would say no worker shall receive less than the minimum wage. So we are going to see in 2014 many more states joining California, eliminating the tip credit. And that's my plea to you here in San Diego. Here in San Diego and in many cities in California, there's lots of talk of the minimum wage going up this year. But there's also lots of talk from the California Restaurant Association about ensuring that tipped workers are left out of those increases. Because they want, in California, what they've got in so many other states. We cannot let that happen. We cannot let California go backwards when the rest of the country is moving forward. Right? We need to ensure that we keep wages the same for tipped and non-tipped workers right here in the state of California so that nobody has to live off of wages. And we keep remembering that the most tipped workers, even here in California, don't actually work at the fancy fine dining restaurants that we may frequent from time to time. They work at the Olive Gardens and the Red Lobsters and the IHOPs. And those women are the women we'd be excluding if we excluded tipped workers here in the state of California. So there are three things we ask of everybody who eats out, uh, anybody with a conscience, anybody who eats, um, those three things are to please help us educate the world um, about this issue. So, you know, 10 years ago, I remember restaurants in New York City saying they'd never be able to afford locally sourced organic food. Now those same restaurants jumping over themselves to say, we provide locally sourced organic food whether or not they actually do, right? And we, we said, how did that happen? And within a 10-year period, these restaurants dramatically changing their menus in 
happened because of consumer demand as the result of books and films like Omnivore's Dilemma and Fast Food Nation and Food Inc. So we observed that and we said we need to replicate that movement's success and partner with it. And so we've come together with the food movement to actually say we need better food, we need better sustainable food, and sustainable food has to include sustainable working conditions for the people throughout the food system, from the farm workers to the people who put food on our tables. <clears throat> and that's why we wrote the book. And that's why we need you to read it and to educate everybody you know. Get it to everybody you know, because just like everybody read Fast Food Nation, and demanded when they went out, is this locally sourced, is this <coughs> organic, are these organic strawberries, where did my chicken come from? Uh, many of you may have seen that Portlandia sketch, mm -hmm. uh, where the couple goes into the restaurant and says, you know, what's my chicken's name, did it have buddies, did they put the little wings around each other? That's a dream for us. We would love it if customers actually asked similar questions about, you know, how are your workers treated, right? So we ask, number one, that you read the book, buy the book, give it to people you know, help us make it as much of an issue as Fast Food Nation and Omnivore's Dilemma became. The second thing we're going to ask of everybody who eats out is to go to our website, thewelcometable.net. It's a new consumer-facing website. On it, uh, Daddy Glover's movie company has actually created a series of beautiful short film portraits based on the workers profiled in my book. There's also a place where you can sign a petition to ask Congress to change this abysmally, ridiculously low wage of $2.13 now. That's number two. The third and final thing I will say is that I beg of you not to leave this room thinking to yourself, gosh, I really should tip better. Or gosh, I really you know, should stop eating out. That would be a disaster. Either of those things would be a disaster. You definitely should tip better. You should always tip better. <laughs> As long as these workers don't have a livable wage in America, they rely on tips because to get them paid as the professionals that they are. But we cannot just think that it's great when we tip better because then we allow the industry to continue to think that it can be subsidized by our tips. No, we need to actually demand change in the same way that we've demanded change around local organic. We ask, does this have pork in it? Is this vegetarian? We're asking every time that you eat out, at the end of your meal, don't go to your server, don't go to any of the workers, go to the employer, go to the manager and the owner and say, I love the food, I actually love the service, I want to keep coming here, I want you to know these issues are important to me. And we have a little iPhone app uh, that you can download for free on your smartphone called the ROC National Diner's Guide, and it tells you how restaurants are faring in your area on issues of wages and benefits and promotions. It gives awards to our high road employer partners who are doing the right thing, providing great wages and benefits. And if you feel uncomfortable saying something, you can use the app just to tweet the manager. Tweet the manager your message. <laughs> but one way or another, please speak up in the way that people have spoken up over the last 10 years about local, organic, healthy. Speak up for workers. Speak up and say, I would love to see you promote your Latino dishwasher to be a server. I would love to see the people of color who are busters actually be waiters. I didn't even get to talk to you about that, so ask me about that in the questions. Uh, I would love to see women in management or in, in more positions in your kitchen than just the pastry chef. I would love to see these things, whatever it is that you think is important. I'd love to see these workers have paid sick days. I want to keep coming here. That's important to me. That's the only way that we can improve the lives of not only the 10 million workers in these industry and their families, we can actually improve the business for employers as well, and we can improve our dining experience for every one of us who eats out. Thank you. such a clear and stark picture of what's really going on in the restaurant industry and uh, what all those wonderful people who take such very good care of us when we're out eating are facing every day in their work experience. Um, we have a panel of local San Diegans to give us a perspective on what's going on here locally and really, um, you know, Saru will stay up here and answer some questions and, and we'll have some other, uh, we have a worker, um, Nellie Watley who is a restaurant employee. So Nellie's a restaurant worker at the La Jolla Marriott. Uh, she and many of her coworkers have been engaged in a union organizing drive for over a year up there. And Nellie is a mother, a working mother who relies on tips to make ends meet because her wages are not even enough to afford her health care premiums. Um, 
Christina Perez is a local business owner. She's the owner of Cafe Madeline in South Park. Hopefully some of you have been there. I have. That's a good thing to say. Uh, it's a very popular French cafe, and it's been highlighted in the San Diego Reader, the Daily Aztec, and CBS, among many others. She and her husband, 